Dr. Letson, would you unmute yourself, please? You won't let you? Okay, just one moment. Thank you, you may begin. Welcome once again, and please join me in the call to worship. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars, she has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in. To those without sense, she says. If you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand true awe of the Holy One and find the knowledge of God. the 174th academic year of Eden Theological Seminary has begun. Let us worship together and seek the wisdom of God.
evening, Eden community and guests and friends. It is good to gather in all the ways we are tonight in this blended space for this celebration of the opening of Eden's 174th academic year. We welcome all in the room, be you digitally or physically present, and we extend a special welcome to our new and returning students, along with our whole community. And especially tonight, I wanna to welcome our emeritus faculty, uh, emeriti faculty, Reverend Dr. Martha Robertson and Reverend Dr. Enoch Oglesby. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. We give thanks to God for the clarity of our purpose as a school of churches and communities committed to the progressive Christian movement. And as a community of learning and faith committed to the liberation of all God's people and God's planet. Now, over these last days, we have been appropriately horrified and saddened by forces of racism, colonialism, heterosexism, and ableism fueled by the ideology of white supremacy at work in our world. And assuredly tonight, our hearts surround devastated families in Jacksonville, Florida, in the wake of that racist hate crime, just as they rush to those who are unjustly imprisoned as sexual minorities facing state-sanctioned murder in Uganda. And yet, as we gather tonight to highlight the work of nurturing theological imagination toward God's good purpose of social transformation, we do not give up hope. Indeed, we resist cynical paths of defeatism and despair by drawing close to one another in the power of the Holy Spirit in all the ways that this school convenes, even though we are sometimes miles and miles apart from one another in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do so in classes. We do so in worship, in study, in fellowship, in protest, in advocacy, in prayer, in organizing, in rest, and at play. And we do it all toward the purpose of awakening our hearts and our minds to the truth that we all, all of us, belong to God. And that God is already, even now, at work redeeming this violent, weary, and hurting world. God's dream of justice, mercy, and shalom, it's a beautiful dream. And together in all the ways this school convenes, we are building a community of learning and faith that bears the promise of sustaining us as we resist all that seeks to demean and destroy to be a people who live out and share the good news of God's dream, God's justice, God's mercy, and God's shalom. So that's right, you may have heard me, and it was correctly. I said we are awakening our hearts, and at Eden Seminary, we are unapologetically seeking to wake up, to get woke. 
to God's dream and to empower ourselves and others to imagine and build communities that resist forces of domination and join God in God's justice, mercy, and shalom. And it is to this resistance and to building together a community of God's dream that we dedicate our worship this evening. So tonight, we in the Eden community are blessed to be in the company of an exemplar of Eden's mission and purpose. Jeanette Mott Oxford, who prefers to go by the name JMO, is an alum of Eden Seminary and is a person whose vocation and public square ministry exemplify Eden's institutional goals of nurturing theological imagination, inspired by spiritual formation for the purpose of social transformation. Because of the church's idolatrous commitment to heterosexism and homophobia, JMO was denied candidacy for ordination in the United Church of Christ in the 1980s. And despite that barrier and others, Z has created a path to develop herself as an agent of God's purpose of building solidarity with poor people, black, brown, and indigenous people, queer people, immigrant people, and people with disabilities leading organizations and institutions such as Reform Organization for Welfare, the Missouri House of Representatives, yes, as an elected state representative for 15 years, eight years. Okay, well, of course it did. God bless you and thank you. Empower Missouri. Metropolitan Congregations United, and currently Paraquad. Yeah. <laughs> JMO has for decade after decade occupied the leading edge of public square ministry, often way out ahead of the church, bearing God's transforming love and agitating all systems, structures, and institutions that participate in demeaning and destroying God's people and God's creation. JMO has done this work closely engaged with their beloved wife, Dorothy, and supported and encouraged by their fellow members of Epiphany United Church of Christ, their longtime church home. And over all these years, JMO, you have inspired your alma mater with your work. While we celebrate your bold leadership at that cutting edge of public square ministry, we also acknowledge the extent to which the church and this school has not always supported you. And we are sorry. Despite it all, you have been faithful to your calling. And we are deeply proud of and grateful for you. So tonight, we are honored by your presence and your address, and you doubly honor us with the presence of all these wonderful gathered friends and colleagues with you. So, Eden community, gathered friends, wonderful guests, please join me now in a resounding welcome 
And thanks be to God for the gifts, leadership, and transforming work of our friend and colleague, JMO. As we gather to begin the academic year, we will now begin with an acknowledgement of territory shared by our Dean of the Seminary and Assistant Professor of pra Practical Theology, Reverend Dr. Sonia B. Williams. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land remains at the center of their lives and spirituality. We who gather on this campus physically, as well as those who are connected virtually to classrooms, offices, and this chapel, do so on traditional territory shared by the Illini, the Osage, the Quapa, the Sioux, and the Terramura, as well as other tribes who pass through this region. Those of us who are participating by video conference are welcome to share in the chat the names of tribes whose traditional lands they reside on as well. We acknowledge First Nations people care of this land throughout the centuries. We acknowledge that their land was taken from them unjustly and we recognize the ongoing harm being done, both to First Nations people and to creation. We acknowledge the longing of many Native peoples for a day when their lands will be returned. We also acknowledge that this land is made sacred by African people who were enslaved and who farmed this land. We remember their blood, sweat, and tears. Tears that nurtured the soil and brought new life. We honor all the ancestors and generations to come who will live as protectors of the water, land, air, and creatures. May we live and learn with respect on this land, bringing about justice and peace and enjoying friendships with this people. Ashe. As we gather ourselves into prayer, I am acutely aware that the prayer with which we are gathering is in some ways not accessible to some of us, because in some ways it requires reading aloud together what is printed on the screen. So when we come to the concluding stanza of this prayer, <clears throat> we're going to switch it up a little bit, and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me what you hear so that all may join in as we conclude the prayer together. So please join me in reading aloud our opening prayer together. Gracious and mighty one, keeper of the seasons and shaper of our days, as we gather to begin this academic year, we give you thanks and praise that your work of mending the world never ceases. In the midst of wars and rumors of wars, you continue to call us to beat swords and missiles into plowshares spears and assault rifles into pruning hooks. In the midst of immigration discrimination, exploitation, and the exposure of agricultural workers to extreme heat, you continue to call us to laws that will allow us all to sit in the shade of our own fig trees. In the midst of barriers to accessibility, and full humanity, 
you continue to assemble those living with disabilities, making a remnant and a strong kingdom of mutuality and joy. Please repeat back what you hear. Now, with the coaxing of the Spirit, out of the words of Scripture, may your word go forth. May your word go forth. That you may teach us your ways. That you may teach us your ways. And we may walk in your paths. And we may walk in your paths. Now and forevermore. Now and forevermore. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the fourth chapter of Micah, in which the prophet describes the shalom, the comprehensive well-being of the days to come. In days to come, the mountain of the Holy One's temple shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Holy One, to the house of God of Jacob, and the Holy One may teach us God's own ways, and that we may walk in God's paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Holy One from Jerusalem. God shall judge between many peoples, and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up swords against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall all sit under their own vines, under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Holy One of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk each, uh, each in each name of its God. But we will walk in the name of the Holy One, our God, forever and ever. Restoration, promise of exile. On that day, says the Holy One, I will assemble those with disabilities and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I've afflicted. Those with disabilities, I will make the remnant, and those who are cast off a strong nation, and the Holy One will reign over them in Mount, in Mount Zion, now and forevermore. And you, O tower, tower of the flock, hill of daughter Zion, to you it shall come, the former dominion shall come, the sovereignty of daughter Jerusalem. Let us all with unmute voided, vo unmuted voices give thanks for these words. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, thanks be to God. sitting in this chapel for the opening convocation service. Feeling a mix of excitement and trepidation. Now I have the clarity that comes from 37 years of looking in the rearview mirror 
And I'd like to talk tonight about what I learned during my three years at Eden. Ways I now understand that God's presence has been with me every step of the way, to borrow from a song title by Christopher Grundy, <laughs> and how all that shapes my understanding of the Micah 4 text that was read earlier. In 1986, I had only been in the UCC for a couple of years. To say I did not have a clear vision of vocational call yet would be an understatement. What I did know was that I wanted to study the Bible and theology, and I'd wanted to for a long time, and I'd been consciously drifting toward seminary for at least 10 years. I was born in 1954 in Southern Illinois, and my parents were members of a gospel, a Southern gospel style quartet, uh, and they sang at revival meetings, some of them under tents outdoors. My mom's brother was an evangelist and an amazing preacher. I remember especially the emotional uh, ends of those services known as the altar call as weeping people came forward to kneel and pray for forgiveness. I estimate that I went to church uh, or revival services about 200 days a year uh, during my early life. I loved church so much that it was my favorite game. I'd write preach, pray, collect the offering, lead the singing on slips of paper. And when kids came to visit at my house, I'd make them draw their rolls out of a hat and we'd act out a church service uh, in the living room or out on the yard lawn. I became that teenager, the one who puts gospel tracts in school library books or on top of a toilet paper roll in a public bathroom, hoping that some poor sinner would read them and be safe. <laughs> After I got my driver's license, I would pick up hitchhikers and build up some speed before I'd turn and say, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior? <laughs> but, in the late 1970s, all that changed because I no longer felt welcome in the church of my childhood. In fact, I was not sure if I would be welcome in any church. I'd grown up in a time and place where there was a great silence about sexual orientation. It was clear, clear that compulsory heterosexuality was an expectation. Compulsory heterosexuality is an Adrian Rich phrase from the 1980s. Yet, despite seeing only models of he and she and a baby make three uh, as the romantic models out there in the world in movies, songs, um, magazines, I still managed to fall in love with the farm girl down the road when I was in high school. It wasn't because somebody read Heather has two mommies to me or something when I was a child. <laughs> it just happened. I was baffled. I was disoriented. It was like getting a letter telling me that I was not really an earthling. I was from Mars. And now the churches in my home county were no longer silent about sex, same sex attraction. A former Miss America named Anita Bryant, who I'd been getting to know from the orange juice commercials that she did on TV, uh, became a spokesperson for a group called Save Our Children, a movement in Dade County, Florida, Save Our Children's goal was to repeal a equal housing ordinance that offered protections for lesbian and gay renters and homeowners. Suddenly it was hard to go to any church in my rural county without the pastor saying things like, you know, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. By the way, and a brief aside here, there wasn't much talk then in Southern Illinois about the B, bisexual, or the T, transgender just L and G, lesbian and gay. I also had no concept of myself as agender then. I'd been taught to think and talk in binary terms. So much has shifted in my thinking and in my language since then. So in the 1970s, I dropped out of church, but a spiritual hunger was always there. It showed in the books that I read, many of them about reincarnation or women's spirituality. It showed in rituals that I cherished including joining friends in potluck meals, discussion of poetry and movies, and producing concerts by lesbian comedians and songwriters at a local bar. A few years later, I was dating the daughter of a Lutheran minister, and she asked me to go to the local American Lutheran church with her. 
So I wound up visiting and liking our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Marion, Illinois. It was really different from the church of my childhood. And I experienced a lot of healing and learning there in the time that I worshiped with them. But the Lutheran Church was often in the national news, debating whether lesbian and gay people would, would be ordained or welcome in their churches. So I wasn't sure if I really had a future there or not. I started taking religion classes at Southern Illinois University Carbondale in the early 1980s. I wasn't sure that was a smart thing to do because my faculty advisor said, you know, with a BA in religious studies, you can be a fascinating cocktail party guest. <laughs> it appeared that living wage employment might not be in my future, but I loved the classes, so I kept enrolling in more. And that led me to cross paths with Church of the Good Shepherd, United Church of Christ, while participating in social justice activities on campus and in the community. Good Shepherd's pastor, Reverend Ted Brown, a graduate of Eden, told me that my sexual orientation was not going to be an issue in the UCC. He said the UCC had spoken out for lesbian and gay people as early as 1969 and again in 1975. He urged me to attend Eden and he brought me to visit campus. I decided to apply and I was offered a Niebuhr scholarship which made seminary a financial possibility for me. And thank you to everyone at Eden who has worked to help students afford the seminary over the years. So yeah, somebody wanted to applaud a little bit there. <laughs> Bless you who raised money, all of you. So here I was in 1986, 32 years old and eager to dive deeper into the Bible and church history. I was also in my second year of a romantic relationship with Dorothy Gannon. I'd met her at a 4th of July party in 1983, and by the next summer we were a couple. Reverend Ted meant well, but lesbian and gay rights was a new topic for him. Since Dorothy had not found a job in St. Louis yet, and I was going to be living, she was going to stay living in Southern Illinois during my first semester here at Eden, Ted advised me to keep my sexual orientation to myself until people got to know me. Well, that's easier said than done. <laughs> when a classmate asks, do you have family here? How do you answer that if you want to be honest, but you also have been told to keep that lesbian thing under wraps for a while? Still, it seemed like I should listen to my pastor's advice. I was kind of new to all this too, so I gave it a try. Within a matter of weeks, I was miserable and I had a perpetual knot in my stomach. I remember there was a telephone booth on the second floor at Schultz Hall. Phone booths, uh, should I explain this? Uh, uh, <laughs> there, there were these devices that you put like quarters and dimes in to make calls. There weren't any cell phones yet. Uh, I desperately uh, made a call uh, to uh, Ohio to talk to the UCC, it was called, then called the UCC Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Concerns, where Reverend Jan Griesinger became my lifeline to sanity. She connected me to two local lesbian pastors, both closeted. The fact that they thought they, thought they had to hide their sexual orientation if they wanted to stay employed was daunting, but at least I had someone to talk to about how I was feeling. I have so much gratitude for the support that I received from Reverend Griesinger and Sam Lolliger, who was her fellow coalition coordinator. They are both now deceased and their memory is a blessing. I may have been feeling incredibly anxious about what to say to any of my classmates during social interactions, but I was loving my classes. The Exodus story got into my bones, especially the burning bush story in Exodus 3. I heard about a God who observed the misery of the enslaved ones in Egypt, who heard their cries, who knew their suffering. Observed, heard, knew. Uh, surely that God would care also for lesbian and gay people who are being persecuted, persecuted in church and society. My first year field placement was with Bread for the World, the Christian anti-hunger group. Reverend Oglesby was my... Uh, uh, director of a January term study where I went to DC to be with Bread for the World, a wonderful experience. I could see connections to the Exodus story there. I saw how an uncaring government set up earnings rules for cash aid and food stamp programs that were not based on the real cost of living. This caused great suffering. 
Yet society claimed that people on welfare were liars and cheats and dangerous. Meanwhile, the Missouri legislature said that a family of three could live on $292 a month, plus maybe another $300 in food stamps. Guess what? It's still $292 a month for a family of three. It has not changed since 1991. Very few AFDC recipients also received a housing subsidy, despite the myth that, oh, all those people on welfare get Section 8. Who's the real liar in this scenario? Who is truly dangerous in this scenario? I heard a well-meaning person in the church say, you know what we should do to help people? We should have a budgeting class for those women on AFDC. I said, no, we ought to offer them a magic class because the only way you can support a family of three on $600 a month is magic. I also started to look more closely at the gospel that Jesus preached instead of seeing belief in Jesus' blood as the key to eternal life in heaven. I saw that Jesus pointed continuously to the kingdom of God, even in the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray, a kingdom on earth, not just in heaven. What if the point wasn't to believe the right things about Jesus, but to live the values of God's kingdom day in and day out? Eugene Worley, who was president of the seminary when I was here, had a way of talking about this. He said the church was like a picture window through which the world could view the kingdom of God. My dad had worked for the U.S. Forest Service and planted something called an experimental forest. What if the church could be an experimental kingdom station, an outpost displaying what life would look like if human beings aligned themselves with God's will? Yes, I loved my classes, and they were sparking new thoughts in me and fostering spiritual growth. Then my mother became very ill with leukemia and died. And my world was turned upside down for several months. It became clear to me that I couldn't grieve properly and hide my relationship with Dorothy at the same time. There just wasn't enough energy to do that. So I came out on campus in 1987, and I also came out to the Church and Ministry Committee in Illinois South Association of the United Church of Christ. That did not go well. I could spend a long time telling you this part of the story, but we don't have time for that. If you want to hear more about it, there are several hours of oral history uh, with me in the Missouri History Museum on their website in the section called Gateway to Pride. You can hear a lot about that if you'd like. Tonight, let me simply summarize, as Deb already has, that the Church and Ministry Committee of Illinois South Association of the United Church of Christ voted to terminate my member in discernment status, and I was unable to circulate a profile in the UCC when I graduated with my MDiv in 1989. Eden did some things well to support me while I was going through the struggle, like offering some educational programs for students when the termination by Illinois South Association reached the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. There was considerable pushback from some local congregations about my presence here. So Eden did a good job of equipping the students about how to answer people that ask them nosy questions about why are they letting that lesbian come to seminary. However, Eden also did reveal some of its growing edges at the same time. For example, Dorothy and I were not allowed to rent an apartment on campus because the rule was you had to be legally married to live on campus. We couldn't legally marry, so, hmm, all right. I think you've gone somewhere since then. After two years of trying to find jobs in more progressive parts of the United States where ordination might be possible, I finally gave up and started looking for a job locally instead. I became executive director at Reform Organization of Welfare, Rowell for short, a not-for-profit organiza organization trying to change public policy around families living in deep poverty. At least Raoul was headquartered in a church. It was at Westminster Presbyterian Church at Del Mar and Union. At Raoul, I learned how important it was to listen to and follow the, leader, follow the leadership of personally impacted people. It was the era of welfare reform in the US Congress. And Raoul was led by an amazing group of mothers bringing up children on aid for families with dependent children. From those women, I learned a quote from Lilla Watson, an Aboriginal rights group women in Queensland, Australia. They said, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have become because your liberation is bound up with mine, 
then let us work together. That statement has shaped everything I have done since. Eight years in the Missouri General Assembly, being executive director of Empower Missouri, which is a not-for-profit working on food security, affordable housing, and criminal justice reform, and being organizer and lead campaign strategist at Metropolitan Congregation of the United. If I am here to help people who I consider unfortunate or the least of these, I should go home. If I am here because I understand my liberation is intimately entwined with theirs, then there is much work to do. And now, finally, I am at the end of my public policy career, or at least I think this is my final job before retirement. But what do I know? <laughs> what do I know? I have been surprised before. In January, I became manager of public policy and advocacy at Paraquad, the independent living center for the St. Louis region. Paraquad has quite a history of contributing to the disability rights movement in the US. For the first time, I am focusing on organizing on an issue where I'm also currently among the personally impacted people. This has done amazing things for my spirit and for my body image. Paraquad's mission is really important work. It is God's kingdom work. Did you notice what the prophet Micah said in chapter four, verses six and seven? The kingdom is not present in its fullness if people with disabilities are not there. God has promised to assemble people with disabilities and to make a mighty nation out of us. This is promised and is just as much a sign of God's kingdom as food security, peace, and life without fear in Micah 4. Huh. Well, that's interesting. If the church is the place where we are supposed to be able to see God's kingdom on display, and it's not the kingdom unless people with disabilities are there, why did religious organizations fight so hard to be exempted from the Americans with Disabilities Act? Huh? Many of, of the people with disabilities who came with me tonight from Paraquad can tell you about the physical barriers that they've experienced in places of worship, not to mention colleges, the state capitol, physical barriers everywhere. And sadly, they can tell you about a lot of attitudinal barriers too. I was intrigued by the word remnant in this text. I knew remnant is a fabric term. So I asked my wife about it because when I met Dorothy, she was the manager of the Joanne Fabric Store in Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> and here's what Dorothy said. A remnant won't stay on the bolt. They don't fit on the display table. They may be small and go unnoticed, but if you're willing to dig through the remnant pile, you can find some great things in there that are real finds and very useful. Too often people with disabilities have been seen as a scrap and not considered fit for the display table. In 1907, the Immigration Act barred people from coming into the United States if a physician ruled that they were physically or mentally defective. Around that same time, some cities passed something called the Ugly Laws. These codes made it illegal for any person who was diseased, maimed, mutilated, or disfigured in any way to show themselves in public. There was a concern that people just might not be able to eat in a restaurant if one of those folks was sitting there. Chicago did not repeal its ugly laws until 1974. Too often people with disabilities have been considered a remnant that is too small, lesser, and of inferior quality. We've been relegated to the status of beggars the word handicap comes from this history that those with disabilities had to beg on the margins with their hat in their hand. In 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a man with a disability, was elected U.S. president and did his best to hide it. The media colluded in that cover-up so that the U.S. would not appear to be weak. In 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act passed, but employers were legally allowed to pay lower wages to people with physical or mental disabilities. They still are, that's right, that's right. People with disabilities have organized and fought for changes to laws and policies, making important gains with the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, but we have so much farther to go. Our employment rate is still significantly lower than that of people currently living without disability and our poverty rate is two to three times higher than that of people without disabilities. Yet Dorothy said you can find some great and useful things on the remnant table. And that sounds like the amazing people who came with me tonight 
people that I'm organizing with at Paraquad. We refuse to stay on the boat. We are unwilling to hide ourselves in a corner and be trapped in our homes. A group of Coloride users has been meeting weekly on a Zoom organizing call that we convened at Paraquad, and we've named ourselves SMART. That stands for St. Louis Metro Alliance for Reliable Transit. We demand a, a paratransit system that works for our region instead of the current one that is failing us. On September 22nd, we are conducting a virtual rally at the next meeting of the Board of Commissioners of Bi-State Development Corporation, the folks who manage Colorado. And you can see me over ice cream later if you want to find out how you can participate. Paraquad and other advocates from the Independent Living Centers of Missouri plus other ally groups won an important change in earnings and asset rules for people with disabilities that Governor Parson recently signed into law. Now, thanks to Senate Bill 106, which went into effect yesterday, more people with disabilities can afford to work and to get married. People with disabilities demand equal access to voter registration and the ballot box. We celebrated the 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act on July 26th at Paraquad with a party that was led by three local elected officials who are people living with disabilities. With amazing change agents and self-advocates like these involved, I think you can see how people with disabilities are essential if we're gonna make our nation strong. There's one final thing I'd like to say about people with disabilities. We live intersectional lives. None of us is simply a person with a disability. Some of us are cis cisgender and some of us are transgender. Some of us are black or Latino, Latina, Asian, First Nations, other ethnic identifications. We may be Protestant or Catholic, Jewish or Hindu. We are of diverse sexual orientations, income levels, ages and sizes. In the kingdom of God, we will be known in our fullness. My life has unfolded in ways that have surprised me since opening convocation in 1986. Although I have lived out my vocation as a layperson, I do have incredible gratitude for the many who advocated for my ordination in the 1980s and the early 1990s. Reverend Brown worked tirelessly on that as did many others. And because of their efforts, I've seen policies and practices change. I've seen many out LGBTQIA friends ordained in Illinois South and other nearby associations. So I'm sitting here tonight. <laughs> And includes my wife, Dorothy, who was a ordained Reverend Dorothy Gannon in 2008. She just retired after 18 years as a hospice chaplain. To the incoming students, if you are not quite sure where God is leading you today, that's okay. Hopefully my story illustrates that, if nothing else. And if you really, really are sure where you're headed, I'd suggest that you loosen your grip just a bit. <laughs> because I suspect you're going to experience some twists and turns and surprises, and a soft grip might just prevent a fracture. I wish you the sense of God's presence and guidance that has carried me through this past nearly 40 years. And most of all, I look forward to visiting the kingdom laboratories, the experimental stations and the remnant tables that you will collaborate in establishing how the world needs to see places that are alternative ways to live, where everyone is valued, our basic needs are met, and no one is afraid. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>
Dana McNamara. I'm the interim director of admissions and financial aid, and I am an average height woman wearing black pants, a green polka dotted shirt, and a black jacket. I have medium length hair and blue eyes. I'm a white person. Today, it is my honor to introduce you to the spring and fall 2023 incoming class. This year, our students will be joining us from near and far as an expression of our high flex learning model. Here is our infographic. Here it is. As you become acquainted with this year's class, I want to let you in on what makes them so special. This year, the 2023 incoming class at Eden Theological Seminary is proud to be represented by members from 20 states. <laughs> Eden's commitment to radical inclusivity is evident by the 14 denominations and non-denominational groups represented. Over 67% of the incoming class have self-identified as women, and 63% are second or third career students. 
And now I'd like to introduce each member of the incoming spring 2023 and fall 2023 class of Eden Theological Seminary. If you are physically present with us, you have some options for what to do when your name is called. You may wave your hand over your head. You may stand where you are if you're comfortably able. You may shout present or here I am, send me. <laughs> <laughs> or if you would prefer to have people and if you would not prefer to have people and cameras looking your way, you may simply smile and know that we are glad that you are here. If you are on Zoom, we invite you to smile and wave when your name is called. I will say each student's name and where they reside. Beginning with our credit non-degree students. Um, one more part. We will hold our applause until the very end of all of our students. Credit non-degree students. Doris Ford Brown, Missouri. Kendall Miller, Missouri. Jeff Remelius, Missouri. Cherie Shaw, New Hampshire. Kay Sind, Alaska. Credit non-degree new students in clinical pastoral education. Erica Brooks, Missouri. Aaron Roberts, Kansas. Our Master of Community Leadership, Ramona Bailey, Missouri. L. Brodsky, Missouri. Ramona Chapman, Nevada. Marcella Cloud, Illinois. <laughs> Kevin Dean, Missouri. Leonte Kindell, Missouri. Jacoby Spresser Mwathi, Missouri. Keisha Williams, Illinois. Professor of Arts and Professional Studies, Terry Key Martin, Nevada. Master of Theological Studies, Sandy Bayline, Missouri. <laughs> Linda Copeland, Arkansas. Nicholas Cormier from Kenya. Nadine Rawls, Georgia. The Master of Divinity degree program, Zach Adams, Missouri. Eddie Burton, Missouri. <laughs> Jarrell Davis, Missouri. <laughs> Summer Daigle, Washington. Everett Fletcher, Missouri. Kim Hedge, Missouri. Jill Krogan, Missouri. Cassandra Lenore, Missouri. Dakota Mashburn, Missouri. Mercedes Montgomery, Washington. Emily Phillips, Ohio. Mark Schmidt, Wisconsin. Shout out. Kia Williams, Washington, D.C. Lori Williamson, Missouri. There's Lori. All right, great. And now for our Doctor of Ministry degree program, Naomi Andrews, Missouri. Regina Clark, Tennessee. Barbara Dickinson, Louisiana. <clears throat> Venetia Dixon, Georgia. Steve Ike, Texas and Illinois. Shannon Garrett Doge, Pennsylvania. Brianna Hawkins, Illinois. Thomas Head, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth Jackson, Maryland. Jay Johnson, Missouri. <laughs> Tipe Cognani, Missouri. 
Albert Whitaker, Massachusetts. Now, will you please join me in applauding, unmuting, waving, cheering, and celebrating our new students. Thank you so much, Dana and student. Will you join me now in a covenant of renewal? It is our tradition at Eden to begin each year with a covenant renewal, pledging ourselves once again to the work of the Holy Spirit in the world following in the way of Jesus. There are different sections for different parts of the community, and I hope you will join us when your part is on the screen. And now, beloved, let us all with our hearts renew our part in the covenant that God has made, and let us move with new resolve, in synchrony with the movement of the Holy Spirit. This renewed resolve means that we are most content when our place and our work align closely with the mind and ministry of Jesus and the realm of God coming near. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations. Others stretch us in new ways. Yet the power to do all these things is assuredly given us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make the covenant of God our own. Let us dedicate our hearts to the Lord and resolve never to go back. Being thus prepared, let us now with sincere gratitude for the grace and steadfast love of God and trusting in the promises of God, invest ourselves anew, sincerely and without reservation. Please join us unmuted, if you would like, as we read together. Divine One, I am not only for myself, but also for you and for your creation. Call me where my gifts are needed most. Form me for compassion. Form me for bold acts of justice. Let me, let me be drawn into the wake of your spirit and the suffering of your people. Let me be full of joy. Let me be full of indignation at the wrongdoings of the world. I freely and heartily join my heart to the way of Jesus and your ways in the world. in this place. Family and friends. We love these ministers and seek to support them. 
We, the faculty and staff, stand ready again to serve you. May all of our interactions with students inside the classroom and beyond help strengthen their commitment to you. And may our labors only help your beloved kingdom to come. Let us all now say together, and now, O oh glorious and blessed one, you are ours and we are yours. And the covenant which we have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Dr. Sonia B. Williams, the Dean of the Seminary here at Eden Theological Seminary. We are the premier institution, standalone institution of the UCC. Amen? Amen. Representing 20 different states. Amen. It is always a pleasure to update you on the good work and ministry endeavors that has taken place this summer and over the past year by Eden's faculty. This is also an opportunity to publicly thank you faculty for being extremely helpful, kind, and putting students first. It is very clear how much your effort uh, you put into the students and how much you enjoy teaching and growing your ministries and adding to the theological enterprise that feeds us all. Our academic Dean, Christopher Grundy, professor of worship and preaching and Dean of the chapel, provided leadership for the annual meeting of the Wisconsin Conference of the United Church of Christ, reported to the Calvin Institute on Sacred Groves uh, grant that is acutely interested in worship and biodiversity and preservation, and provided awesome leadership to the programs team while I was out on sabbatical. So thank you so much. 
Dr. Kristen Leslie, the Harold Peter Schultz Professor of Practical of Pastoral Theology and Care. She presented two workshops at the annual meeting of the Society of Pastoral Theology and is writing a chapter on forgiveness for the book Mass Trauma and Healing in Rwanda, with Dr. Susan Dunlap is co-authoring the book Faithful Responses to Homelessness, presenting uh, in January a webinar for the Soul Repair Center on Military Sexual Trauma in the U.S. Military Academics. Uh, D-men students, did, did you hear that? Okay. And through the Eden Gleaning Gardening Project, received a grant from the Missouri United Methodist Foundation and has gleaned and distributed uh, to area ministries 2,000 pounds of asparagus, sweet corn, and potatoes. Stay tuned, cabbages this weekend. <laughs> Raquel, Dr. Reverend Dr. Raquel Letzum, we celebrate with you on your newest appointment as a professor of New Testament and Womanist Biblical Interpretation. <laughs> and our first fully digital professor. Thank you for teaching this summer, uh, the Mark and the movie especially, uh, and engaging asynchronous learning, all while continuing this year, preparing an article for interpretation in honor of Brian Blott's retirement, preparing plenary lectures for the Academy of Homiletics, engaging the community through online Bible study for RS Ministries, and excitedly launched digital devotional series for the month of August with seminarian intern Kendall Moore. Reverend Dr. Dietra Wise, this September will be featured in Preaching Racial Justice, a book by Orbis Books that will be in high demand across the globe. <laughs> you will find a chapter in there written by Dr. Wise Baker. This summer at the UCC Senate, this summer she taught an educational intensive on reparations in which the declaration passed without debate. So she explained it phenomenally. She directs and leads the Center of Live Faith and as such will lead the Gamilio Women's Leadership Training as their trainer this year. Dr. Clint McCann developed asynchronous versions of Hebrew grammar. Let me repeat that again. Dr. Clint McCann developed asynchronous versions of Hebrew grammar, Hebrew exegesis, and Old Testament surveys, and will lead the International Studies Seminar this course uh, this January in the footsteps of Romero. He has published uh, several articles and are in several books, one being called Reclaiming Divine Sovereignty, Psalms 93 through 100. Another translation of and commentary of the Psalms 146 through 150 and timeless ancient Psalms for the church today. And again, uh, he uh, presented at the annual meeting of the event Evangelical Theological Society presenting on Psalm studies today. And in great appreciation of Dr. Jill Baker, she has recently designed a self assessment tool for the marks as part of Eden's network model. This tool helps committees on ministry work with their candidates for authorization using the marks for faithful and effective authorized ministry from the United Church of Christ. I want to thank you all for your hard work and dedication to the community of learning and faith. And in celebration of this new academic year, please join us outside for ice cream immediately following this service. Before we receive our benediction, I want to mention that uh, as for our recessional, there's going to be a song on the screen that shares with you a history of disability advocacy. Um, and there's a part for you to sing in it. I don't know if we have a PowerPoint. We do not. Um, do we have the video? The video is in the Google Drive. So I'm going to tap dance for a moment while we <laughs> while we pull that up um will you tell us a little bit about where this song came from sure and some of us this some of us this summer went to um a conference called roots and remedies uh and uh i met a woman there from texas 
uh, who uh, writes song parodies, and one of them that she one of them that she wrote uh, is to uh, uh, the uh, Billy Joel song "We Didn't Start the Fire," but it's the history of the disability rights movement done to to that. Uh, and um, so uh, this this is by her, uh, and her name is escaping me because Maria. There we go. Maria uh, wrote this. Maria Palacios wrote this. So uh, it, you will be hearing of, about some of the things I talked about earlier. I think the ugly laws are probably in there, uh, but there is a whole history of disability rights uh, to, to that, um, that song by Billy Joel. So there's a part for you when it comes along, the words will change color on the screen. Um, that's the refrain. And you're gonna be invited to sing, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning, but then there's a change. Since the wheel's been turning, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the wheel's been turning. And then the same, almost the same thing again. We didn't start the fire. It was reignited when we got united. Try that. It was reignited when we got reunited. So each time that comes along, uh, you can jump in and sing that. Do we have it? We do. All right. Um, we're going to receive our benediction. And then as that song plays, uh, we're going to invite uh, us, uh, we're invite you to sing as some of us recess. We hope that you've enjoyed being in the presence of the kingdom of God tonight in its fullness. And thank you, my Paraquad friends, for coming to make this very real. I've been so touched. Thank you. All right. May the blessings of God be upon you. May Christ's peace abide with you. May the Spirit illuminate your heart now and forevermore. Ellen Keller, FDR, Fair Labor, Standards Act, Cripple Children, Iron Lung, Poster Child Born, March of Dimes, Polio Vaccine, Miracle Lobotomies, MDA, Jerry's Kids, Institutions, Eugenics, Euthanasia, Social Anesthesia, Willowbrook State School, People Left to Die, Ed Roberts, Rolling Quads, Architectural Barriers Act, Independent Living, Berkeley CIL, didn't start the fire it was always burning since the wheels been turning we didn't start the fire we just helped relight it when we got united judy human 504 disabled people fight for more san francisco sit in crippled occupation disabled people's lives adapt access is a civil right bob Cafter, we will write transportation rights deaf culture asl revolution gala dent message to the hearing world deaf president now lex frieden justin dark disabled people organized tom harkin capital crawl marco bristow we didn't start the fire it was always burning since the wheels been turning. We didn't start the fire. We just helped relight it when we got united. George Bush, ADA, disabled people make their way. Inclusion, integration, cripple liberation, mercy killing, segregation, human rights violation. Play God not dead yet, Terry Schiavo. AAPD, access peer counseling, assistive technology, visibility, poster children all grown up, Jerry's orphan speak up, disability pride force, Superman falls off a horse. We didn't start the fire, it was always burning since the wheels been turning. We didn't start the fire, we just helped relight it when we got united. 
Ni casa Medicaid, free our people long-term care. Our homes not nursing homes, homestead decision. ADA amendments act, disabled advocates react. Push girls, culture clash, ableism. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, disabled people on the map. Intersectionality, crime sustainability. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the wheels been turning. We didn't start the fire. We just helped relight it when we got united. Peer networks, online world, disabled models, fashion run, devotees, wannabes, inspiration porn, equal access to healthcare, hands off my Medicaid, disabled lives hang on the line. Carrie and Lucas rev up crypto vote. Politicians taking note. Ali Stroker, DIA, Generation ADA, Crypt Millennials lead the way. The young disabled people know the future is accessible. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the wheels been turning. We didn't start the fire. We just helped relight it when we got united. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the wheels been turning. We didn't start the fire. We just helped relight it when we got united.